Hey guys, this is Stowe Bishop with Radio Rothbard, and I wanted to let you know about an exciting event we have coming up on September 23rd in Nashville, Tennessee. One of Ron Paul's favorite lines was, truth is treason and the empire of lies. Americans around the country are waking up to this reality, war across the globe, regulating free speech at home, printing trillions of dollars. The regime accepts no limits to its power. Speaking on this topic, we all have brave truth tellers, including Ted Carpenter, Michael Rechtenwald, Jonathan Newman, and many more. Again, this is on September 23rd in beautiful Nashville, Tennessee. You can find more about this event and get your tickets at Mises.org slash Nashville 23. Hello and welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ron McMakin. I'm an executive editor with the Mises Institute. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Tho Bishop, my associate editor. And also, it's been a few weeks since we had Mark Thornton on, our senior fellow, who keeps track of all of that economic data, who uh, knows a whole lot about the Austrian business cycle theory. And we're just going to look a little bit and really just provide a bit of an update about where are we in the business cycle? How should we be viewing the unemployment numbers that are coming out, uh, all the optimistic numbers we get from the White House telling us uh, how there's just been massive job creation uh, and how uh, inflation has been solved. That's all, that's all taken care of. Don't have to worry about that anymore. And really just look at some of the, the news of the past couple of weeks that's been coming out as well as some of the larger context. Uh, and I think just at, at the Mises Institute, we don't want to portray ourselves as just being constantly bearish, right? Uh, there was no doubt that in 2018, 2019, uh, the U.S. was in the midst of a, uh, <laughs> a easy money-fueled boom, and it was a boom. There was no reason to deny that, and uh, that, that, that does exist at times. And there was uh, a period of that from about 2015 to 2019. Of course, a lot of it was fueled by just massive amounts of monetary stimulus, which now seems small and reasonable almost compared to what occurred in 2020, 2021, and 2022 in terms of new money creation. So then, of course, there was another uh, monetary inflation-fueled boom during that period. And so the question is then, well, when, when, when do these booms end? What are the effects of these booms? And really just appreciating that because a, a point that can't be made enough is that the mistake that the Fed makes is in creating the boom. Not what a lot of Wall Street analysts would have you, have you believe, which is that, well, the mistake the Fed makes is uh, allowing interest rates to rise too much or getting too hawkish about inflation. And they say, well, the Fed could thread that needle and they could, uh, the, there could be a soft landing and everything would be fine. No, no. The Fed already was making massive mistakes years ago when it settled on a policy of immense amounts of monetary inflation. We lived through the boom period and now uh, we're trying to figure out exactly what's happening with the bust, uh, which is always inevitable and which is actually the economy healing itself if, it, if the, the Fed and the central government will allow it to do so. The real problem is in the boom, not in the bust. Uh, and so at this point, we're really just trying to observe what is the backside of this boom period that uh, most people now, if you're under 30, that's most of your whole working life now at this point. So let's look into that just a little bit more closely. And just generally, Mark, I want to get your impression of how, I mean, the, the news for the last two weeks has been, at least in the mainstream headlines, overwhelmingly positive for the most part. Oh, inflation's down to about 3%. So you don't have to worry about inflation anymore. That's no big deal. Uh, and also, uh, the job market is quote unquote tight and job growth continues. So basically, uh, it sounds like happy times are here again. So maybe just start off with the inflation issue then. Uh, so has inflation been solved, Mark? Not by a long <laughs> shot. I mean, the inflation statistics uh, have obviously gone down some, but uh, they're far from being controlled. It's, you know, 
price inflation is far from being controlled, even according to the Fed's own standards. Um, and then if you look around the world, with the U.S. dollar as the dominant currency, uh, inflation rates are even higher. So we came out of the COVID lockdowns and that enormous $10 trillion stimulus, and our in price inflation uh, went up quicker and faster. Um, and now the Eurozone is fully um, out of COVID. China is fully out of COVID. Uh, they're starting to experience the same problems that we did. Uh, but it's, you know, I would say that this is a middle ground, a transition period at best. It's not the Goldilocks scenario that everybody is talking about uh, on Wall Street, that the Fed has successfully brought down price inflation uh, that it hasn't uh, undermined financial markets very much, even though it's brought down three of the largest uh, banks, bank failures in U.S. history. And, of course, there's no ec economic growth, despite the fact that the labor force, according to government statistics, is fully uh, employed. And, and, of course, with inflation high, that means real wages for the productive classes in the United States is going down. And so if you've got lower wages, stubborn inflation, um, no economic growth, and, you know, so we do have to look to the future a little bit here to see what that transition is from and what that transition is to. And I, I really thank you, Ryan, for pointing out that Austrians, you know, we realized that there was a, a, a you know, a Fed expansion in the teens. Austrians were expecting um, uh, at least a contraction in 2020. My skyscraper book in 2018 sort of implied a, a correction, a recession, or a crisis in 2020. And then we got $10 trillion of stimulus. And then we've gone through this um, crazy chaotic economy for the last two or three years. And, you know, some of the st statistics have uh, sort of stabilized um, to a certain extent. Uh, but I think it's a, a transition for more difficult times ahead, uh, despite the fact that if you listen to the mainstream media or the Wall Street media, you get that story that the Fed is managing everything correctly. And, uh, of course, there's now anticipations that the Fed is going to raise rates one more time. And then they're going to be getting beginning to cut. And, you know, some indicators say that the cuts are going to come fast and hard, um, which throws people off a little bit. But that's the difference between the Goldilocks scenario that we hear about a booming economy, full employment, inflation under control. Therefore, according to the Goldilocks theory, the Fed can cut rates aggressively and push the economy forward. Um, but if you look at more of a negative perma bear type of outlook on things, we got to realize that the economy is not good. It's bad. Uh, that there's a lot of chaos in labor markets, that real wages are going down, that the money supply um, figures that uh, we've been publishing show a tremendous contraction in money and credit. Um, and then, of course, we have a building and, and very obvious problem with commercial real estate in this country. And so the permabear scenario basically looks at the economy a little different, and then it comes to the conclusion that these expectations for Fed interest rate cuts are not because everything is great, but because there's likely going to be some kind of crisis um, in the next year or so, and that the Fed is going to have to respond with aggressive rate cuts. And I think that's one of the big factors behind uh, the weakness in the U.S. dollar right now. Yeah, the uh, there is every reason to expect that if 
as soon as you have any real sign of rising unemployment, which becomes a political problem, then the Fed starts to cut rates and get back to easy money. That as long as I think you can claim that politically things are fine, then the Fed doesn't feel like it's going to have to be activist in that case. But it seems that the political response is always going to be easy money. So once you can start to make hay of that as a critic of the administration, then all bets are off and you're just back to easy money again. So it would seem that the more um, cynical, and I don't mean that in a bad way, uh, <laughs> the more realistic, the less naive yeah. view is that, yeah, it, once there is an obvious crisis, then you're just back to uh, cutting rates again, and that's bad for the value of the dollar. Um, and so I, that probably is on the horizon then. But yes, you, you, you point out that the growth is bad and uh, the growth rates are bad. And we can look also at really what is the net worth of ordinary Americans right now and, and what is happening in terms of, of wealth accumulation because uh, that's really not often discussed in the government data because they just look at, at job numbers, at, at non-farm job numbers, and then they focus even on just the establishment survey. They don't even look at um, the number of actual employed persons. They just look at the number of jobs. Uh, so there's actually, if you just move beyond the headline number, you can see that there's a lot more... Um, it's a lot more nuanced to the job numbers than just constant crowing about how tight the job market is. But looking at that, Karen Petru did a lot of work on this over the last decade, right? Just as Austrians had predicted with all this constant stimulus uh, producing more lackluster growth, that has in fact been the case uh, in her book, Engine of Inequality, where she looked at what has been the outcome of all of this Fed intervention from 2012 and the decade that came after. And it has been one in which normal, ordinary people have seen their net worth suffer. The real estate they own in middle America has not been going through the roof, so they haven't even been getting real estate-driven uh, gains in uh, personal growth and wealth. And just that a lot of that wealth has been concentrated in uh, certain coastal cities, uh, that it's really driven inequality, all of this uh, uh, Fed easy money and that it's benefited people who already owned immense amounts of capital uh, and could do a lot with super, super cheap loans. Uh, but for regular people, that just hasn't been the case. And so you've seen actually a falling behind of regular people. And you can see how quickly those people get ignored when, uh, depending on how you measure it this time, you saw that in the June numbers, uh, that for the first time in 27 months, uh, that the average hourly earnings number came in slightly above the inflation number. So it was actually positive real uh, earnings growth for the first time in more than two years. And this was immediately reported as, well, problem solved. Uh, now everyone's getting richer again. Never mind the fact that you've been digging a hole for yourself in terms of negative wage growth for the last two years before that. So one one quarter of wage or one uh, month of wage growth and we're supposed to declare problem solved and now everybody's fine. But the fact is everyone was actually falling behind in terms of real wages and we saw that then in massive increases in credit card debt. We're still in a country where people, uh, where more than half the population, really considerably more than half, tells us that they don't have even $500 for any sort of emergency, like a car breaking down, that sort of thing. Um, and not to mention just ongoing price increases where we're not getting back any of that lost value of the dollar that we lost over the last three years, just because the increase has for now slowed to 4.3% in the core CPI. Wow. Uh, that comes after uh, a year of 40 year highs in inflation. So it's really just interesting to see the way this is being spun uh, by the administration. You're supposed to think that everything's fine. But people have been trained just to look at the unemployment rate. So that, uh, that just enables the administration to, to say everything is great. Um, but again, just as Austrians, we're always just encountering the issue of timing, right, Mark? Because if... Now, I haven't found it all that confusing, right? If you look 
at the actual historical data and you look at, gee, when did the when does the yield curve turn negative, and then how much longer does it take for there to be some sort of uh, re recessionary um, uh, impact? It's often a year to 18 months, if not sometimes longer. And what I've seen then is that people who are trying to convince us that everything is fine, they'll say, well, uh, there's no sign of the long predicted recession. But the thing is, people haven't been predicting recessions necessarily for early this year or anything like that. Even the real mainstream people are saying, um, or even real the bears are saying, well, yeah, later in 2023. Um, and... And so I, I think it's just a, it's a war of words and rhetoric to portray people who are looking at all these obviously bad numbers in terms of temporary unemployment or temporary employment jobs, which is way down, uh, looking at home price uh, declines, looking at decelerating uh, money supply, um, the yield curve and all of that, and then saying, oh, yeah, this, this all points toward recession but then people claim that we had said that a recession was going to happen uh, five days later. And then when it didn't, somehow, oh, yeah, look, uh, they were wrong and now everything's great. And so it just seems that uh, we just, in addition to just really analyzing the numbers, we have to constantly fight this rhetoric war where people are just trying to, uh, to, <laughs> to defend the administration by saying that, well, everything's fine because there hasn't been a full-blown financial crisis in the last year. So... Uh, they must be wrong and, and everything's great. Just like back in the late 1990s when people were in the Wall pages of the Wall Street Journal legit saying that the, uh, the money or that the uh, business cycle had ceased to exist, that the problem had been solved altogether. So there's always, I think, this effort to just, uh, again, say this time is different. And I guess we're just looking at various um, variations of that now. So... So what do you think is like, I mean, what is the political situation here in that from what I can see, the economy seems to be something of a non-issue in terms of I just don't see much talk about it at all um, from either side. I mean, Biden says everything's fine, but I don't see any of his critics willing to say much about the economy uh, at all. It's just because they don't they don't understand it or it just doesn't seem like a sexy enough issue. Well, the approval rating of, of Biden is obviously very low by historical measures. Um, you know, there, there is I, it, the focus on the culture war, I think, has, has really captured a lot of the campaign cycle, at least from the Republican side. Um, some of it, you also have just the, the Trump shadow over everything where you have continuing indictments rolling out, which ends up creating this dynamic where, you know, it, it becomes, you know, who can speak out most, li most loudly against the FBI, against various agencies, which is, which is not a bad thing, but you're right, there is a, uh, I think that the communication on the economic side of it, it's, uh, it's also made a little bit more difficult with some heightened anti-market skepticism within certain sectors of the intellectual right, where you have, you know, sort of this conversation about you know, they're, they're relitigating, um, you know, isolationist or pr protectionist policies when it comes to trade and, and some very, you know, the, with the rise of people like uh, J.D. Vance in the Senate and things like that. The message on the right, even in terms of superficial political uh, rhetoric, is becoming a bit more muddied, to, to, to say, um, to put it lightly. Um, obviously, there's no one that's interested in dealing with a lot of the main drivers in terms of entitlement reform, spending, et cetera. We saw a complete lack of political will to hold out when you had the recent debt ceiling dynamic. Um, but I, I do think that there is a political cost to the economic issues that we have right now. Um, E.J. Uh, e. Itoni, um, who is a colleague of a friend of ours, Peter St. Ange, with Heritage, he had a, a study a few months ago um, where he tried to uh, Quantify, you know, what is the, the real light, the, the real world costs of the inflationary environment that we're living in, looking at not just simply CPI broadly uh, applied, but looking at specific sort of average household items. And the, their measure came to um, that the effective impact on American family budgets was north of $7,000 per, per household right now. And I, I think that that is a hit. And again, I, I think it plays out more in terms of the overwhelming uh, optimism or lack thereof about the direction that the country is heading 
the, the unpopularity of Biden. Um, the, the, the issue is, though, is that, you know, who, who do you trust politically within this environment? The, you see that a little bit in terms of, you know, maybe the way that people are, are moving to certain environments, right? You know, Florida's economy, um, you know, is performing better than most of the nation. You have a lot of people moving in there. But then, it gets, then you get to the other side of it, where if you move to Florida, you're dealing with very, very high real estate prices in a way that you're not gonna get in, in other parts of the country. So it's, it's this aspect where you know, do you go to a hot economic environment while well, you're, you, you're, you're gonna have that priced in with the cost of your house. If you go to a, another area, you're not seeing the gains there. And so it's this very difficult situation. And I, I think there's a larger aspect where specific industries are feeling the squeeze you know, as, as we've had this you know, pivot in terms of interest rates and things like that, you know, we, we've already seen it within the tech sector. Um, we've seen it in aspects of, again, housing markets in areas of the country that are cooling off, um, labor squeezes in areas where it's not. Um, but I, I think even you could look at something like the, the actor strike going on in Hollywood right now, where you have, you know, various aspects that go into production of TV and movies where the, the, the change with which consumers are consuming this sort of content, you know, we think about all the streaming apps that have popped up in the last 10 years, part of that, you, you know, as, as a byproduct of the, the larger uh, uh, you know, interest rate economy, the rise of all these different technological changes and the like, you, you're having members of that specific industry. Now, obviously there's, there's very much a union component to it that kind of makes it a lot more complicated. Um, than, than some other areas, areas of the economy, but we're seeing it with, with big tech, we're seeing it with entertainment services, we're seeing it within some of these areas that benefited tremendously from the, the low interest rate years during the Obama and Trump administration, that even they are now kind of, I think, at the tip of the spear in terms of dealing with some of the real disruptive aspects there. And I, I think so looking at that industry by industry breakdown um, is, is very interesting, and I think is, is a sign of things to come um, you know, when kind of the, the chickens come home to roost. Yeah, well, th that actually leads you to a, uh, a question, and Mark, I don't know if you've had any thoughts on this, right? When we look at recessions of the last uh, three or four cycles, there's often one particular industry that seems to be sort of the, 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 the tip of the spear on that in terms of what seems to be the most in trouble. Um, it was, of course, housing in 07. Uh, then, of course, before that, it was the famous dot-com bust. Um, where in this cycle are should people be looking to see some of the, the most disruptions um, and maybe some of the biggest changes that might maybe help us understand a little bit about what's going on in the economy right now? Like what, what industries seem to be the most affected uh, and might just go uh, have the most weird things that <laughs> that require extra explanation and some real analysis. Well, I think the biggest industry right now on the agenda is the commercial real estate industry. Uh, that really has been blown up over a long period of time. Uh, there's tremendous excess capacity. Uh, for office space, uh, for business hotels, uh, skyscrapers, retail, you know, the list just goes on and on, um, where the occupancy uh, leasing rates uh, just don't add up to the point where uh, the project, uh, people who started these projects, where they can pay the uh, bankers back for the money that they borrowed. So I think that's going to be uh, front and center. I've also looked at, you know, on the Mises Wire, I've looked at the streaming services. I've looked at technology and Apple, the financial industry. Uh, I think this is going to be a broad-based crisis. And I think uh, Tho is right about uh, the political ideology that is most worrisome, I think, to the productive classes is that you know our choices right now at least at the national level though dealt with the state level but at the national level we have biden we have uh probably trump uh jerome powell in the board of governors 
Uh, as far as sound money is concerned, they're all dovish. They're all pro-inflation. They're all for Fed stimulation. Um, and that goes beyond the, the leaders of those parties and the leader of the Fed um, down to the staff level. So, and then if you look at you know balancing budgets, um, peace, um, you know all of the major issues that form the ideological bulk work of the economy. They're all very very weak right now. It's very very troublesome, and. Before I look into the future, I think Ryan's point about credit card debt is worth further exploration because credit card debt, if, you know, the economy is good, uh, why are people going further into debt? Well, sometimes uh, a very good economy can encourage people to go into debt. You know, if you're expecting to get a better job, higher real wages, um, you might use your credit cards and, and other uh, loan facilities to uh, get better living quarters, get better furniture, electronics, automobiles, so on and so forth. So uh, a very good economy can drive up uh, consumer credit, but a very bad economy can also drive up consumer credit. And we have American workers – Yes, there are plenty of job opportunities or job openings, at least, out there. Uh, but real wages have been going down, and people have been using up the savings from the stimulus, COVID stimulus, and they've been running up their credit cards. And I think that that's a very negative sign. So when we look at this kind of balanced picture that the mainstream media wants to tell us about, or even a very bullish scenario about the current situation, uh, you know, the same thing. Uh, but I think the credit card uh, situation and the increase in debt there is indicative of the real story about this transition period that I've been speaking of. And then going back to the inverted yield curve, you know, it's fascinating. You look at this inversion of interest rates where short-term interest rates rise above long-term interest rates and the differential can fall to zero or it can actually go negative. Now, if you look back at the, at the time series data of the yield curve, what you'll find is that very often the yield curve will fall to zero or maybe a little bit negative for a short period of time and then, yes, we'll have a recession 6, 12, 18 months into the future. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, depending upon what long-term rates and what short-term rates you're using. But also, if you look at the inversion of the yield curve, the examples of that where the inversion was very deep or very negative, where short-term rates... Uh, were much higher by a percent or two above long-term rates, which is unusual. Um, so if you get deep inversions that last a long period of time, that's very rare. Okay, that's only happened a couple of times in the 20th century. Uh, the Great Depression was one, and then there was a, a series of inversions in the late 70s and early 80s. And, of course, that was one of the most horrific economic times um, in U.S. history and certainly during my lifetime. And what we have right now, and I pointed this out in the Minor Issues podcast, is that the inversion occurred m several months ago. It continues to be inverted, and the inversion is quite deep. It's uh, roughly three-quarters to one percent inversion, and so that's lasted. And so what's happened when you get these deep and long-lasting inversions is a real economic crisis rather than just an ordinary uh, average recession correction, and that's one of the main reasons why I have confidence that, you know, economic crises are not, they don't come along very often. 
uh, maybe once or twice in a person's lifetime. But the inverted yield curve right now is signaling not just a recession, but a severe economic contraction or crisis. Yeah, I, I, th I would definitely encourage people to check out a look at, uh, at the graph, at the yield curve <laughs> time series, if you haven't. Um, I'll post an updated version of it on Mises.org this week, and uh, uh, you can see just how, how far down that's come. Yeah, this is not like one of those things where it's, it's hovering around zero for a little while or went slightly negative. That's not what we're looking at right now. So, uh, yeah, it's an unusual thing. Um, now, as a last question for you, Mark, um, the on the issue of the dollar, on your last um, Minor Issues podcast, you, which the one was titled The Dollar is Down, um, we did look, you looked a little bit at the dollar index, and now it's fallen 12% since last October. Um, and we touched on this at the, at the beginning of the episode a little bit about uh, how they're expecting easy money again as soon as there's signs of economic trouble. Uh, now, we at, we editors at the Mises Institute, we've also tried to avoid a situation where people are constantly predicting the doom of the dollar. And we've even had to reject some articles because every time there's some little news about BRICS or some country decides, says it's going to back its um, money with gold or something like that, you get, you get people writing articles about how the dollar is going to uh, completely implode within the next 90 days. Uh, so we, <laughs> we try to keep uh, a lid on people going completely overboard, predicting the imminent demise of the dollar. Uh, however, uh, touching on what you had said earlier about, yeah, everybody expects uh, a whole lot more money printing, uh, say, a year from now or less. Uh, if the unemployment rate surges, that that clearly is going to make people uh, bearish about the dollar. The question is then, though, from the larger geopolitical side of things, is if the dollar is going to go down, what about all those other major currencies? Are they all going to go down too? Is this a global situation? Um, just to wrap up, let's, let's take a little bit of a peek beyond the U.S. here and see what you think in terms of other currencies and other economies. Very good question. And uh, interest rate differentials really drive the short-term changes in the relative value of one currency versus another, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the British pound, etc., the Swiss franc. Um, and so interest rate differentials matter, and so I think that is a driver, a potential strong driver for a lower dollar relative to all these other currencies. And, you know, you're right. I mean, the dollar is uh, the best of a lot of really bad currencies. Um, we have a military um, and, uh, you know, uh, just all sorts of resources so that if anybody does peep up and say, I'm going to back my currency with gold, somehow or another that seems to get snuffed out. Um, but they cannot forestall forever, uh, you know, the uh, absolute decline in the value of the dollar and its purchasing power. And that's been gradual. It's been sustained. Um, when does a uh, dollar collapse is very difficult, uh, impossible really to predict because it's going to take, uh, you know, things like a rise of an alternative such as a brick currency or a situation in which the United States is particularly disadvantaged in terms of its government finances. So. Um, you know, a breakout of uh, worldwide has, ha, hosti hostilities in the Ukraine-Russia situation uh, would certainly be a driver of that or the establishment of an actual uh, brick, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa and other allied countries forming their own currency their own uh, banking institution, 
uh, developing an alternative to the dollar as a reserve currency and as an international transaction currency. Uh, we've been anticipating this for now over a decade. And so, you know, it's slow, steady decline, uh, but that will be punctuated uh, by events. And if we take one look back at the British pound, which dominated everything just like the U.S. dollar, uh, World War I came around and the British economy collapsed um, and the British pound lost its standing as the number one currency in the world. Um, and it was, uh, you know, devastated uh, by the after effects of World War I and the Great Depression. So uh, events are happening. They're slow and sure. The more the U.S. abuses its standing uh, with respect to the U.S. dollar and the national debt and international affairs, uh, the quicker that's going to come. And then we're going to see discrete changes like the BRIC currency um, and, and other events that uh, are going to have a precipitous you know, if, if the BRICS uh, countries do set up a bank and do issue a trading currency or a reserve currency, um, you know, that's, that's when the fireworks start. All right. Well, I think that's a great place to uh, end this episode of Radio Rothbard. Uh, thank you, Mark, for joining us uh, and giving us uh, another update. And, yeah, I don't... <laughs> We'll see what happens at this next Fed meeting, uh, what they do with the, the interest rate at that one and with their portfolio, if anything. Um, and uh, we'll follow up with you again in uh, another several weeks. And, of course, thanks to Tho, my co-host, uh, for this episode of Radio Rothbard. And we'll be back again next week with another one. So we'll see you next time. Hey guys, this is Tho Bishop with Radio Rothbard. And if you've enjoyed this episode, I hope you'll check out Mark Thornton's podcast, Minor Issues. Minor Issues provides succinct economic commentary a few times a week by Dr. Mark Thornton. And we've got a special treat for you. This is the episode mentioned on this podcast. The dollar is down. So check it out. You can find Minor Issues with Mark Thornton at Mises.org slash Minor Issues or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Minor Issues Podcast. Well, all signs look clear and positive, according to the mainstream media. Inflation is lower and predicted to head even lower. It seems now that there is no need for the Fed to continue to raise rates. So we may only get one symbolic increase in rates and then jobs, jobs still seem to be plentiful, and the unemployment rate is near historic lows. And the debt ceiling issue has been taken care of. The University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index is now at the highest level since September 2021. So what's not to love about the economy? Well, here's a little cold water in this episode just a minor issue about all the dollars that you use, including the dollars in your salaries and your wages and your pensions and your benefits, your life insurance policy, bonds, everything that's dollar denominated is subject to the effect of the influence of the value of the dollar. If we look at the dollar, we see a downward path. Going back to when the stock market turned around in early October of 2022, the dollar index was at almost 114, and the NASDAQ had fallen to 10,320. Today, in early July of 2023, the dollar index is at 100, falling 14 points. And the NASDAQ is up over 14,000. So while the NASDAQ stock market is up almost 40%, 38%, the dollar index has lost 12% over that same time. If you look at other stock markets, because the NASDAQ is really the leader in a bubble, 
both up and down. The Dow Jones Industrial Average over that same period is up 16.5%, and the S&P 500 is up 26.1%. All of that has to take into consideration the fact that the dollar has lost 12% of its value over that time period. And of course, bonds have also lost at least a little bit of money over that time. And of course, most of our wealth and our money is tied up in dollar denominated assets. Stocks and real estate are two non-dollar denominated assets. The cold water, the minor issue this week is that while stock markets are up, the dollar is down and we don't forecast the value of the dollar or all of the various effects that change the value of the dollar. But we do know that a decrease in the value of the dollar means higher prices. And if that trend continues, that means more inflation ahead.